Okay, Your Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, friends, thank you so much for being here today. I know we're having some trouble with interpretation on the French channel. Um, if you do need interpretation into Spanish, you're going to click the globe icon on the bottom of your screen and switch to the Spanish translation. On the back end, my colleague Alfonso will be working with our French translator to try and get that working as soon as possible, and we apologize for any issues in getting that started. Um, thank you for putting your places um, in um, where you're coming from in the chat as well. And we're just so happy to have people joining us from around the world for the UN 2023 Water Conference. This conference has been about 46 years in the making. It's been 46 years since the last UN conference on water. And um, Caritas has been working for quite some months now to make sure that we are contributing in the way we know how, which is in a localized humanitarian and development way. For those of you who are not familiar with who we are as Caritas, we are really the beating humanitarian heart of the Catholic Church. We are 162 members strong in over 200 countries and territories, working before cameras get to a conflict or natural disaster situation, working during situations, and working after them as well, staying with the people and letting the people decide what their needs are and how to best serve themselves. So once again, thank you for being here from around the world. It's now my pleasure to introduce a um, special guest that we have, the special rapporteur on the right to safe drinking water. And I'm just going the, the right uh, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Water and Sanitation, excuse me. And the purpose of this mandate, which is mandated by the United Nations Human Rights Special Procedures of the Human Rights Council of the UN, is to focus on the issue of human rights obligations related to access to safe drinking water and sanitation, carry out thematic research, undertake country missions, collect good practices, and work with development practitioners on the implementation of the rights to water and sanitation. Yes, this meeting is being recorded. So if you do not want to be recorded, please feel free to turn your cameras off. It's also being live streamed onto Caritas's YouTube for those to join from around the world. Uh, furthermore, about the special rapporteur, he began his personal mandate in um, was appointed by the Human Rights Council in September 2020 and started his mandate on the 1st of November in 2020. From 2016 to 2019, Mr. Rojo Agudo served as an elected member of the Spanish Parliament. He was also a professor in the area of fundamentals of economic analysis at the University of Zaragoza from 1989 to 2011 and has been Professor Emeritus since 2011. The last three decades of Mr. Pedro Rojos Agudo's work has been focused on his research on economics and water management, publishing his work in more than 100 scientific articles and in 70 books. So we are so grateful to have a video message from him now, and I will play that for you. Dear friends, for the first time in almost 50 years, the United Nations is convening us to reflect in a major world event on the global water crisis with 2 billion people without guaranteed access to safe drinking water and more than 4 billion without basic sanitation, the vast majority of whom are not probably thirsty people without water in their living environments, but severely impoverished people living next uh, to rivers or unpolluted aquifers a crisis that climate change uh, will undoubtedly exacerbate. Well, in that context, I propose to work on overcoming two major challenges. First one, making peace with our rivers. If we really want to guarantee drinking water to those two billion impoverished people, we must be able to restore the good condition of the rivers, streams, uh, wetlands uh, and aquifers from which these people draw their daily water supply. 
And second, promoting democratic governance of water, understood as a common good, accessible to all, but not appropriable by anyone, and therefore not as a commodity. When the management of water and sanitation services is privatized, or water itself is commodified, citizens are transformed into mere customers, which far from helping to solve uh, this global crisis, contributes to aggravating it by making the most impoverished even more vulnerable. For this reason, the recommendations uh, of both uh, my predecessor, Professor Leo Heller, and my own, in our respective thematic reports on the risks of privatization, commodification, and financialization of water, encourage the promotion of participatory and transparent models of public management and community management, reinforced by public-public and public-community partnership strategies. I would like to draw your attention to exemplary a community realities such as those offered by indigenous peoples and many peasant communities, for example, the network of aqueductos communitarios in Latin America, that you from Caritas know much better than I do, uh, with around 100 million impoverished people managing their own water and sanitation community systems, leaving no one behind. I always insist on the need of a profound ethical reflection that allows us to discern and establish priorities. How can we compare, for example, the value of the water we need to guarantee a dignified life for our families with the value of water to fill even legitimately a swimming pool? This is why I propose four levels of ethical priorities. Water for life in life-sustaining functions, uh, water for life is that vital minimum we need to ensure a dignified life as a human right. Water for life is also the water needed by impoverished rural communities to produce their own food, which falls within the scope of the human right to food. And water for life is also the water needed to ensure healthy and sustainable rivers within the scope uh, of the human right to healthy and a sustainable environment. In a second level should be the uses and functions that we consider to be in the general interest of the community, of the society. The uses of economic development, uh, for economic development, uh, beyond the satisfaction of human rights, should be placed at a third level of priority, aware that they generate the greatest demands and risk of pollution. And finally, what a crime! in productive uses that put uh, public health or the sustainability at risk and which uh, being illegitimate should be illegal and avoided at all costs. Managing water under these, under these ethical priorities will allow us to develop an approach governed by the paradigm of sustainability and by the priority of human rights as demanded by the United Nations. This conference should offer a broad space of dialogue with water defenders as right holders, recognizing their role uh, at the forefront of the struggle for the human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation, for which they, have, they are often criminalized, persecuted and even killed. The Manifesto for Water Justice promoted by social movements with the participation of indigenous peoples marks the path that water defenders as right holders are proposing to the UN. I'm sure that Caritas organizations are encouraging this movement that demands to listen to the unheard, uh, opening a new path of recognition of water defenders and collaboration with them and particularly with women as the most interested and committed to accelerate the pace to achieve SDG 6. Thank you very much. We're so grateful to the Special Rapporteur for having sent us this message and especially highlighting that water is life and that clean water is a just practice that must be localized, especially for women. And that is part of our policy position paper, which we'll share later with you all. 
but I want to go straight to our panel because we have such distinguished panelists that have so much to share and introduce our wonderful moderator working on natural sciences in, at UNESCO, Ms. Susan Schneegans, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brianna. And uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody, as the case may be. Uh, welcome to this panel discussion. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, today, uh, we shall be hearing from four panelists. I will introduce them uh, in a moment. Uh, they will be describing community-led practices for water management and governance in different parts of the world. Each of their interventions has been inspired by one of the interactive dialogues being organized at the United Nations Water Conference, uh, which winds up tomorrow and which was mentioned by Brianna. Uh, our first panelist today, uh, for example, will focus on the theme of water for health. Our second panelist on water for sustainable development. Uh, the third panelist on water for climate, resilience and environment. And our last panelist on the theme of water for cooperation. Should you wish to ask the panelists a question, uh, can you please uh, wait until the last panelist has spoken? Uh, simply leave your, uh, write your question in the chat. Uh, we shall open the question and answer session once all four panelists have spoken. Uh, and we shall be relying on the chat uh, to identify your questions. So as Brianna mentioned, this webinar is one of the side events of the United Nations Water Conference in New York. The conference comes at a defining moment. The world is not on track to reach its water related um, targets for sustainable development, and there are some pretty uh, daunting statistics, uh, but we have to change this dynamic because if we don't, we face an imminent global water crisis. Now, don't take my word for it. It's, this is not me saying this. Uh, it's a much more authoritative voice than myself. Uh, this message has uh, come from the United Nations World Water Development Report, which was released yesterday. This report is uh, published by UNESCO on behalf of more than 30 United Nations agencies uh, that have a mandate for water. The World Water Development Report uh, considers that between two and three billion people worldwide are currently experiencing water scarcity. That's a phenomenal number. This scarcity is expected to worsen in the coming decades unless we can strengthen cooperation, uh, including international cooperation, but also at the local level. And as the uh, UN uh, Special Rapporteur just said, also between public authorities and communities. And some of the case studies that we're going to hear about today will provide concrete evidence of, of how uh, this approach can work. We need more cooperation, more partnerships to accelerate the pace of progress towards reaching our water-related goals. The case studies we're going to hear about today provide examples of what communities can achieve when people work together. These case studies portray what Caritas calls communities of care. It's a nice term and very fitting. These case studies will paint a vivid picture of the water situation for many communities. They also send a message of hope though, we mustn't be too gloomy, because they provide examples of tried and tested solutions that should be able to inspire communities elsewhere. I would now like to introduce our first panelist, Mr. Paul Borsum from Cordaid, a branch of Caritas that is based in the Netherlands. Now, uh, you may, if you're very observant, you may have noticed that behind him, there is a sign that says Caritas Ukraine. <laughs> uh, that is because at the moment he is um, sharing his time also with Caritas uh, Ukraine. Paul holds a master's degree in civil health engineering with a focus on safe water and sanitation. He's worked for Cordaid for 13 years. For the past seven years, he's been Cordaid's advisor for safe water and sanitation to the humanitarian aid unit and program manager for the Americas. He also has extensive experience of disaster risk management, preparedness and response. Today, He'll be addressing the theme of water for health, including the human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation. Note that these are two separate rights. There is a human right to clean water and there is a human right to sanitation. 
these have been recognized by the United Nations as being two distinct human rights. Paul, uh, welcome, and uh, I look forward to hearing, hearing what you have to say. The floor is yours. Thank you, Susan. Um, yeah, I had to get on the both logos on my back because I work 50% for Cordate at the moment and 50% for Caritas Ukraine, um, dividing my time. Uh, I think that Alfonso will put up the presentation. Yes, there it is. Very good. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Maybe good evening, some people. I don't know wherever you are. Uh, thank you for uh, for letting me uh, speak at this uh, at this event. Um, Water for uh, for health. I would like to uh, introduce the topic uh, with two uh, examples. First one is uh, wash in healthcare facilities. Uh, which is a direct link, of course. And the second one is WASH, and then uh, specifically water in frontline areas in Eastern Ukraine. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, I won't go in very much detail into WASH in healthcare facilities, as tomorrow there's a, a, a separate uh, side event uh, on this, organized by, uh, as you can see, the World Health Organization, IFRC, uh, and some other organizations. So if you're very much interested in more detail on the topic, I, uh, I suggest you to register there. Next slide, please. The context uh, on the Caritas side uh, with uh, healthcare facilities, but I think first worldwide, um, one in every five healthcare facilities lack basic water services. One in three have no hand washing stations and one in 10 even lack a toilet. And um, as uh, some people have said, a, a healthcare facilities, a facility without decent wash cannot really be called a healthcare facility because you get uh, more sick than then you will be uh, treated well. This puts more than 1.8 billion people at risk and it contributes to the spread of preventable infections with one in six patients contracting a new infection during their hospital stay. And this is really preventable. Tragically, mothers and newborns are especially vulnerable. More than 1 million newborn deaths every year are associated with births in unclean settings. Next slide, please. Can you click one more? This is, uh, just to show you a bit of context, this is what we aim for. Nice uh, water coming out of a tap where you can uh, uh, do your hygiene practices. You click, please. This is what we often encounter in a lot of places. Still there is water, uh, but the setting is already uh, a, a lot less. Next, please. Then also you find this kind of, of, of situations. Uh, I don't know if you want to have your dog in your toilet. And then the next one. This is also what we encounter a lot of times, um, where the toilet is mainly used as a storeroom uh, and not as a toilet. Next, please. What are Caritas' efforts in, uh, in healthcare facilities? You may not know it, but the Catholic Church is the largest unified provider of essential healthcare services in the world. The church, including its parishes and members, as well as its global mission and service organizations, deliver effective healthcare to the most remote areas and the poorest without distinction of religion, nationality, ethnicity, or any other factor of discrimination. Uh, in 2021, the Vatican's Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development is leading an initiative to improve wash conditions in healthcare facilities with an initial focus on 150 Catholic healthcare facilities in 24 countries, because also those suffered from the problems that we, that we saw before. Yes, please, next slide. And I can uh, just tell you a few results. Um, there are so many examples that uh, it's impossible here in the, in the short time that we have to, uh, to display all that to you. Caritas, and Caritas, uh, Caritas Mali and Caritas Haiti are implementing WASH projects in healthcare facilities with funding received from this initiative. Also, WASH facilities in other local Catholic-run healthcare facilities are being improved, but apart from that, 
other healthcare facilities as an offspring from this initiative are being improved as well, like coordinated in South Sudan, improving wash facilities in health. There are eight healthcare facilities in Eastern Equatoria and Caritas, Germany, improving healthcare facilities in the Central African Republic. Next, please. Also, of course, during the COVID pandemic, uh, our efforts were uh, very much uh, important in healthcare facilities. And so in many countries, Caritas has supported the healthcare facilities. For instance, Caritas Niger, Benin, and Congo have provided mechanical hand washing devices. Caritas Rwanda supported 119 healthcare centers across the country, distributing hand washing devices and bottles of liquid soap. Community health centers were equipped with hand washing stations, soap and water containers. And in Yemen, Caritas Poland has increased local communities access to safe water by restoring and rehabilitating three existing water points. Just a few examples. Next, please. Some uh, lessons from the wash in healthcare facilities during COVID uh, uh, activities that we did. Um, there was a fund, a Caritas fund, uh, and per project, the funding was a maximum of 100,000 euros. Uh, but sometimes it was uh, it was, was, was small because uh, for bigger healthcare facilities, it might be necessary to have more funds available. However, uh, those funds were uh, very well targeted and it responded to locally driven priorities, both in terms of vulnerable groups as well as priority interventions. Um, a de decentralized system, as Caritas uh, has, was able to identify the needs and respond quickly during the acute stages of pandemic and resulting lockdown. Caritas was able to use its network to support local authorities' measures and reach the most vulnerable as identified by local communities. Working across different religious groups was important to tackle discrimination against migrants, asylum seekers and refugees and work together across religious differences and with private sector contributions, like for example, in South Africa. Next slide, please. The other topic I wanted to touch upon briefly is wash in frontline areas in Eastern Ukraine. And I say wash, but it's more about water supply. Next, please. If you look at Eastern uh, Ukraine, uh, you probably know that from 2014 onwards, the Russian uh, the, the Russian government the army has occupied, or at least supported, uh, occupation of uh, of the east. And you can see here a map which is from 2016, which indicates the area that was under Russian occupation uh, practically. Um, and this conflict in eastern Ukraine it disrupted uh, also communication between settlements and regions on both sides of the contact line. It was almost a closed uh, border. Uh, this also, of course, concerns the utility connections and distribution lines, resulting in numerous settlements being isolated from the district centers and utility lines, including community facilities, social and medical services. So sometimes you have your, your healthcare facility on the other side of the contact line, so you couldn't go. It also includes uh, cutting of water lines, electricity lines, storage systems, making uh, the situation for several um, uh, communities around the contact line very difficult. Caritas Ukraine implemented the program for the creation of decentralized sources of drinking water, which also is a bit of a novelty in, in Ukraine, where a lot of the water systems are very centralized and almost industrialized. Next slide, please. A few characteristics of the program. The systems were designed so that the local population has access 24 hours a day to drinking water in a region where the local population has little access to such water as a result of an ecological disaster. Difficult soils and presence of coal mines and granite quarries made the task difficult. Eastern Ukraine is a very highly industrialized area, also has a lot of mines. And that's also why it is the, uh, the, the economic motor of, uh, of Ukraine and also why it is so very important for, for Russia to, to occupy it. But it also has had its influence on uh, pollution. So filtering equipment was installed in the pumping stations, which made it possible to give people water of drinking quality. 
because without that, it's it's not drinkable. And the number of people who benefited from these activities is about 27,000 people. Next, please. What is interesting is this, this initiative started uh, somewhere in 2019 when, when it seemed that the conflict was rather stable uh, and, and, and you could work quite close to, to the contact line. Uh, however, in the actual situation with the escalation of hostilities and other offer, we, we can offer alternative water supply options in uh, the areas around the contact line. At the moment, there are uh, huge uh, populations without water at all. You cannot say they don't have drinking water. No, they don't have water at all. And these stations are the only ones that um, that offer uh, at least some some services. And there's a picture of one of the stations there. Uh, with this one, I want to conclude my uh, presentation. Can you click, please? Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Paul. And uh, it, it's very interesting that you, you took the approach of um, first looking at countries such as South Sudan, Haiti, Mali, uh, which are of course experiencing different challenges uh, from uh, from Eastern Ukraine. So the the comparison is very interesting. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, our priority is to give time to the panelists to speak. So. I shall now move on immediately. Paul, please stay because uh, you will uh, probably be asked some questions later on by our uh, participants. But in the meantime, I'd like to introduce our second panelist. Welcome, Sibanda. Uh, he is development coordinator of the Caritas program in Zimbabwe. Welcome has 33 years of experience in both the private sector and uh, the development sector. Uh, and he brings to these sectors his expertise in financial management and uh, also project and program management. He has been coordinating Caritas work in Zimbabwe for the past 15 years, where uh, he is responsible for its uh, development strategy. Before we hear from Welcome himself, we shall be treated to a video which gives us an overview of how the community living in the province of Bulawayo is practicing integrated watershed management and agroecology to make water go farther in a region where water is a scarce commodity. As you may have guessed, the theme of Welcome's intervention is water for sustainable development, uh, the theme of one of the interactive dialogues. So without further ado, um, could we please uh, play, play this video, which will uh, show the need to value water and also uh, how integrated water management uh, is so important at the the water energy food nexus. So time to, yes. view, the, time to view the video. Yes, and then, I'll be uh, playing, welcome will speak. Yes, thank you. I'll be playing that video just now. I just wanted to note that in case it's difficult for the interpreters to hear or those of us listening in English, then please just allow the photos and video to speak to you. They have been created by the Diocese of Caritas Bulawayo in Caritas, Zimbabwe, and we're very grateful for the work that they've put into this. Greetings viewers. My name is Welcome Sibanda. I'm the development coordinator for Caritas Zimbabwe under the Archdiocese of Bulawayo where today we are having a discussion on community-led water initiatives. Our focus area is Matopo district that is located in the southwestern provinces of Zimbabwe, where these communities really note that water is not a free good and water is an economic good. Water is scarce, water is life. These communities are into agroecology. Agroecology that is part of the food chain or food systems that contribute to the food systems in the communities. These communities are practicing water integrated watershed management approaches. These integrated water management approaches come in in many forms where the communities are able to really interpret the water cycle through the watershed by making sure they are able 
to slow down water, rain water, for the purposes of food production. They are also able to spread water so that it supports different catchment areas. They are also able to sink water so that it supports the infiltration process. And they are also able to, to store water so that they keep the underground water recharge systems uh, in place. These are some of the sustainability uh, solutions or measures that these communities are undertaking. So today, we are going to have discussions and interactions with these communities and get to understand how they practice these initiatives, both in field, at household, and at community level. So let us hear them discussing and presenting how they undertake their community-led initiatives. I'm Slendile Moyo, an agro-farmer from Matopo district in Tema Ward 17, Slunguzi P village. So in Agro, we are doing watershed management, whereby we see the water coming and then we slow it, we stop the speed of the water, we store it in these condos, and then after storing that water, it sinks, and after sinking, it spreads to our crops here, and some of the water we use it on this fish pond. So that's where we practice agroecology on watershed management, seeing that water is life, is being used for agriculture and just for domestic uses. Yeah, these are some of the results of the integrated watershed approach, where now these farmers at this household are now seed secure. As you can see now, they are having a seed bank. Part of the produce of this seed is coming from the dead level condos that then support that produce to come in the form of seed. We really appreciate now that they now have seed reserves that enable them for continuous food production all year round. Some of the community water infrastructures are the bowls, which serve a multi-purpose for both drinking and livestock watering purposes. They also support the gardens. These are locally managed by water point committees who are responsible for ensuring the sound management of the water systems. However, we also have to note that water point committees need to be more strengthened on the administrative part when it comes to efficient use of water, since water is a scarce commodity. I'm Mr. Sam Moyo of Zezelen Garden. I'm here responsible of this half moon. I'm the half moon management. So we have done this to catch water and this half moon has made us to make this cake to come and drink water here and now we have this grass this side this side was just was plain we thought no grass but now there is a grass this is St. Joseph Community Dam, which is managed by the dam committee. The purpose of the committee is to manage the sanitation. These are some of the big water bodies that are dams, which are then rehabilitated and then also managed by the dam community. But for sustainability, siltation is one of the measures that have to be managed so that this dam yes, enough holding capacity. So there are storm trains that have been constructed that also manage siltation to this dam. So that the dam has enough water holding capacity. So this dam is a multi-purpose in that it's for livestock, it's for the community for drinking purposes, and above all, such water bodies, they contribute to the water cycle. Through that process of evaporation, it is part of what contributes to the water cycle so that at the end of the day, nature prevails and people have water again. So 
even the watersheds around this area are also managed to support this dam. The final question then comes in, how do people manage comp competing issues with water? How best do they then make sure they manage that? The answer yes is true, it's testified by this. It is through agroecology. The concept of agroecology, that is farming in harmony with nature, promotes less usage of water but production of more food, which then leaves other water for drinking purposes and livestock purposes. I'm sure this is how we sum it up to say agroecology emphasizes on economic use of water. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank, you very much. thank you very much. Welcome. Um, that was very interesting, and I, I like uh, the, your your definition of agroecology, the economic use of water. I think that just about sums up uh, uh, a lot of the techniques uh, that were described uh, very well in this video. So, uh, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much. Greetings to everyone, and it's a great pleasure to be part of this meeting. Well, just to sum up with, within the two minutes that I've been allocated, just to say our strategy as Caritas Zimbabwe Bulawa is anchored on the Laudato Sea on care for creation. I think we have shared that profile so that we can also have it. But what is left is within the 5,000 households that we have reached out to them on agroecology and the community state initiatives on water, we feel there is a need for further engagement processes where so far at the moment they are able to engage their local leadership, but we still feel they should engage more also the local authorities, including the government, so that they can also have a voice over policy formulation when it comes to local management of water. We also feel this has to be amplified further into urban areas where we are also noting rural urban migration, where there is a high influx of people moving into urban centers. In urban centers, we note a high or a huge demand of water. And there is also a need maybe for the urban populace, populace to start realizing that there is a need for water to be effectively managed, where people, especially those in urban centers, must be at the center of having decisions around sound water management systems. Because if that area is not addressed in the near future, water is likely to be monopolized into a business entity when it comes to urban centers. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you very much. Welcome. You've really, you've really hit the nail on the head with um, uh, the, the, the tricky question of how do you uh, manage competing uses of water between domestic use, agricultural use, industrial use, and also another important point you made was the need for uh, the authorities at the local and, and national level to be more engaged to, to support this kind of initiative uh, as a way also of slowing down uh, urban migration, migration to urban areas. Uh, thank you very much. You've conveyed a, a lot of very important messages. Uh, we now come to our third panelist, Mr. Alirio Caceres. I hope I pronounced his name okay. Uh, he is advisor to Caritas on integral ecology. He will be speaking on the theme of water for climate, resilience and environment, which is another theme uh, of one of the interactive dialogues. And as such, he will be covering issues such as biodiversity and perhaps also disaster risk reduction. Uh, I should note that uh, Alirio will be speaking in Spanish. So uh, now is the time to uh, activate the interpretation button if your Spanish is a little bit rusty. Uh, welcome, Alirio. Bienvenido. Uh, <laughs> Hola, un saludo de paz Hola. y bien, el inmenso amor de Dios. Pues yo vengo de Colombia, el país del encanto, y estoy encantado de sumarme hoy desde Roma, aquí en la oficina de Caritas Internacionales, a este trascendental evento en el marco de la Cumbre del Agua. 
voy a compartir algunas imágenes y algunas ideas referidas a una mirada desde la ecología integral de laudato sí, frente a esa relación eh, que hay entre el agua y el desde América Latina y el, y el Caribe. Entonces acá hay un, un concepto clave. Uh, excuse me, Alirio. Ah, sí, it's here now. Sorry. Uh, your your yeah. screen now is, is working. Sorry. Ok. Entonces hay un concepto clave que es el de ecología integral para poder a, a evaluar y proyectar esta relación del agua con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, especialmente los referidos al clima, a la resiliencia y al ambiente. En la encíclica Laudato Si, publicada en el 2015, el Papa Francisco incluye el término ecología integral, da la necesidad de una mirada, una mirada que tenga en cuenta todos los factores de la crisis mundial e incorpore claramente las dimensiones humanas y sociales. Una mirada integral e integradora de las relaciones de los seres creados por Dios en la tierra, entendida como oikos, es decir, como hogar común. Esta innovación epistemológica nos traslada a comprender la realidad, en este caso la realidad del agua, desde ese lente de la complejidad. Y por eso es que constantemente la Udato sí insiste en que todo está conectado, todo está interligado. Por eso es necesario que al analizar el agua se implique un diálogo entre la ecología ambiental con la ecología económica, social, cultural y de la vida cotidiana, incluyendo la perspectiva de la ética del bien común y de la justicia entre las generaciones. Es que no estamos afrontando dos crisis separadas. No hay una crisis social, ambiental del agua y una crisis social del agua. Hay una sola y compleja crisis socioambiental. Por eso... Todo planteo ecológico se convierte siempre en un planteo social que integra la justicia en las discusiones sobre el ambiente para escuchar tanto el grito de la tierra como el grito de los pobres. Dicho de otro modo, el clamor del agua es el mismo clamor de los empobrecidos que no tienen acceso a ella. Hablar del agua en relación con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible es hablar de justicia en la distribución de la misma. Hay un giro conceptual. El ejemplo vivo de la ecología integral es San Francisco de Asís. Para él son inseparables la preocupación por la naturaleza, la justicia con los pobres, el compromiso con la sociedad y la paz interior. De hecho, Francisco alaba a Dios por la hermana agua y la describe como útil, humilde, preciosa y casta. La hermana agua es alguien, no algo. Entonces el primer campo de debate hermenéutico es la referencia al agua como sujeto, no como objeto. Decirle simplemente recurso hídrico es empobrecer su valor. Esto nos conduce a un escenario de diálogo con cosmovisiones ancestrales indígenas, afrodescendientes, mestizas y algunos movimientos contemporáneos que le dan un significado sagrado al agua. La madre agua, la hermana agua, incluso la diosa agua. Y mediando, allá aparece toda esta movilización que habla de los derechos de la naturaleza o los derechos de la madre tierra, hasta llegar a posicionar al agua como sujeto de derechos. Tenemos el ejemplo del río Atrato en Colombia como sujeto de derechos. Tenemos el gran bioma, la Amazonía, corazón biológico del planeta que se caracteriza por la abundancia de aguas 
subterránea, superficial y los llamados ríos voladores que regulan el clima del hogar común. También es sujeto de derechos. Entonces hay una jurisprudencia, unas leyes, una normatividad que se convierten en fuente imprescindible de este giro epistemológico que aparece aquí representado. O sea, tratar al agua como un sujeto y que tiene derechos. Pero también reconocer que los seres humanos tenemos un derecho fundamental al agua. Es decir, que no es una mercancía. Esto implica que hay que buscar soluciones más allá de la lógica del mercado, privilegiando la vida y el diálogo con las personas que habitan los territorios más ricos en agua. Lo que está sucediendo es el clamor del agua, es el clamor de los pobres que no tienen acceso a ella por causa del antropocentrismo, de la alianza nefasta entre tecnología y economía que atropellan los derechos humanos y los derechos de la madre tierra y cierto relativismo moral. Entonces, la acción buscando el agua limpia, segura, potable y el saneamiento tiene que hacer referencia a esa mirada sobre el agua. Aquí el Papa Francisco nos regala un ejercicio de discernimiento que debe plantearse en orden a discernir si se aporta un verdadero desarrollo integral. ¿Para qué ese proyecto? ¿Por qué? ¿Dónde? ¿Cuándo? ¿De qué manera? ¿Para quién? ¿Cuáles son los riesgos? ¿A qué costo? ¿Quién paga los costos y cómo lo hará? Y dice, en este examen el agua tiene prioridad por ser un bien común, escaso y vital. Es un derecho fundamental que condiciona el ejercicio de otros derechos humanos. Eso nos lleva a un nuevo escenario y es reconocer que hay unas organizaciones en torno al agua, la iglesia hoy en día junto a otros actores sociales, ambientales, eh, civiles, está trabajando en estas redes eclesiales territoriales de ecología integral. Tenemos aquí la REPAM, que es la red eclesial de la Amazonía, la REMAM en Mesoamérica, la REPCHAC, que es de la Gran Chaco y Acuífero Guaraní. Es decir, el agua como base de entendimiento de la acción eh, social. Y esto tiene relación con un movimiento amplio de reconocimiento que frente a la emergencia climática tenemos que conservar este cinturón verde ecuatorial y por eso hay otra red en la cuenca del, gran, del río Congo y una red hermosa en su nombre y en su mirada en, entre Asia y Oceanía, que es la red de los ríos sobre el océano, la, la, la OEN. Nos marca entonces, y vuelvo a esta diapositiva, un discernimiento, una mirada para entender qué es lo que sucede en nuestros países. Y como, por ejemplo, el asesinato de Berta Cáceres, indígena lenca, hondureña, hace siete años, también en marzo, o lo que está pasando actualmente en la selva amazónica, con los Yanomami, con, en, en, envenenados con el mercurio, o lo que pasa en el cono sur con el litio o el cobre, estos eh, elementos importantes para la llamada transición energética, que es muy justa con la huella de carbono, pero es injusta con los territorios, con los ecosistemas y con los habitantes de esos territorios. De modo que tenemos que plantear casos que nos lleven a una incidencia ciudadana buscando el bien común. Hay un caso representativo que es el de Caritas El Salvador, que ha tomado la iniciativa de una ley de derecho al agua y también una ley de prohibición de la minería metálica o una organización como Caritas Ecuador está liderando, que es la Red Nacional de Pastoral Ecológica, muy fundamentada en agroecología, 
y pensar un poco cómo esos ciclos hídricos unen el campo y, y la ciudad. Entonces, en nuestro continente se verifica que ese paradigma tecnoeconómico que está denunciado por la Udato Si refleja la voracidad del extractivismo, ya no solo con hidrocarburos o metales preciosos, con los agronegocios, sino con la explotación minera de materias primas e insumos para la transición energética. Además, el ciclo del narcotráfico ocupa un lugar protagónico en las afectaciones socioambientales que desencadenan amenazas, agresiones, asesinatos de líderes y lideresas y en general violación de los derechos humanos. Al respecto, las principales causas y esas amenazas a la condición del agua y la falta de disponibilidad de la justa distribución para consumo humano tiene relación con esas actividades extractivistas. Y entonces, en ese balance, en esa ecuación de buscar una reducción, una mitigación, una, una compensación de, la, de los gases de efecto invernadero, es muy importante reconocer que debemos conservar la, la selva en pie, que la selva caída, la selva talada, los altos índices de deforestación están contribuyendo también a hacer más grave el, la situación del cambio climático. Y en ese marco hay varios mecanismos en donde Caritas, junto con otras organizaciones civiles, está participando para mapear los conflictos en los territorios. Por ejemplo, hay un atlas del cuidado de la casa común, de la red de iglesias y minería, o una campaña del agua de la plataforma Reconciliación, Democracia y Derechos Humanos, o el Observatorio Laudato Si de la Universidad, Universidad Católica de Costa Rica, entre otros. Finalmente, entonces tenemos un, un reto de buscar cómo generamos unas nuevas maneras de consumo en la relación entre países del norte industrializados y nuestros eh, países abundantes en bienes de la naturaleza, no somos despensa, no somos eh, el, 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 el supermercado que promueve y dota un estilo de civilización que nos tiene al borde de la hecatombe. Tenemos que buscar necesariamente otras relaciones que aparecen allí eh, planteadas por ejemplo, en la plataforma de acción Laudato Si, en comunidades de cuidado como las que promueve Caritas con la campaña Juntos, Juntos Podemos Soñar, Juntos Podemos Actuar y responder al clamor de la hermana tierra, de nuestra hermana agua, a los pobres, a una economía de Francisco y Clara de Asís, a un estilo de vida sobrio y sustentable, a una educación que transforme la cultura del descarte en una cultura del cuidado, a una espiritualidad encarnada que pasa por el agua, que se empapa con, con, con el líquido vital y nos hermana para generar una participación que busca el bien común para dar gloria a Dios en la vida plena de este hogar común. Entonces, juntos continuamos cambiando el paradigma y haciendo que nuestras experiencias locales participativas sean sustentables en el cumplimiento de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible en cada territorio. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Eli Elirio. I'm going to spare you my appalling Spanish. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I did note uh, that uh, you said, for example, um, anotado que todo está conectado, que hay una sola crisis, tenemos un reto, identificar un nuevo modo de consumir. Uh, and I think it's very clear to everyone who is listening that, uh, that everything is interconnected. That is actually why the sustainable development goals uh, are actually also very inter interconnected. They overlap. Uh, I hope everybody who's listening is familiar with the sustainable development goals. So uh, thank you very much. And please, Alirio, um, stay with us, quedar, quedar con nosotros, because we will have a question and answer session uh, after our last panelist, David. 
So without further ado, and I might just make a plea at this point to uh, people who are following this webinar. Uh, this is your chance to ask uh, our panelists a question. Uh, I don't think there have been very many questions so far. So please don't be shy, ask your question. And uh, we'll come to this question and answer session very shortly. So our last speaker is uh, David, Dr. David Tetze. David holds a PhD in Environment and Development from Leiden University in the Netherlands and two master's degrees, one in Engineering Management from the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom and a second degree in Environmental Engineering from the Technical University of Denmark. David is a Ghanaian American uh, with over 22 years of professional experience in water, sanitation, hygiene design, hygiene program design, resource mobilization, and strategy development and strategy implementation. Uh, David, uh, he is the global uh, lead of the water, sanitation, hygiene, and environment program at Catholic Relief Services. And he's also adjunct faculty at Purdue University. Uh, he has also worked for the United Nations Children's Fund, better known as UNICEF, uh, in the past for over 14 years. So David, uh, we're very much looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say. Uh, your theme will be water for cooperation, the theme of one of the interactive dialogues at the conference. Uh, the floor is, is yours, over to you. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for that introduction. Um, and I'll just pick up from the special rapporteur's presentation or video that we just watched, where he highlighted the need for uh, duty bearers and right holders uh, to sit around the table. And also from the previous uh, panel members with regards to how water is a common good. All these points speak to what uh, we need to talk about in terms of water cooperation. And this is to remind ourselves the team for this year's uh, water development report, uh, which is water and partnership. So what exactly is water cooperation? Uh, uh, it's essentially how all the different actors work together at different levels uh, to be able to come to a peaceful management of uh, of water resources and its use. Uh, and we see that being shared with us through case studies from the three presentations. And this is very much linked to the different decision-making processes and also funding uh, streams. Um, the SDGs as it is, it clearly states uh, how cooperation itself should take place uh, as part of uh, SDG 6, clearly from 1 to uh, 6, 6.1 to 6.6, .6, and also singling out uh, how integrated water resource management, SDG 6.5, uh, with specific reference to transboundary uh, related uh, water resources. So this is a, a very important issue uh, and very critical to what we do as water sector uh, partners. The key thing is uh, water cooperation happens at different levels, at local level, uh, watershed level, international level. Uh, so it depends on uh, what uh, issue you are or what the different stakeholders are trying to uh, solve. Uh, with regards to what is happening with CRS, I would like to share with you our, our approach to this. Uh, CRS, you know, it's uh, our strategy, the corporate strategy, it's in their own hands. And our work is actually guided uh, by the Catholic social teachings, uh, where we take, uh, we try to implement uh, the principle of subsidiarity. Uh, and making sure that people who are close to the problem know the problem very well and they should engage all the actors to sit around the table and discuss. And also stewardship, God has given us uh, water, which we all know it's finite and it's common. So we need to steward it for our, ourselves and also for the future generation. So we do this uh, two different ways. We have a, a water security strategy that reflects that. So what it does, it, it looks at the whole water cycle. 
uh, essentially from water resource management, how we do uh, water uh, agriculture and industrial practices, all the way to provision of services at homes and at institutions, and also the governance and finance aspect of it. Uh, so that's how we do it. Just to give you an example of how we've been able to translate this at different levels. If you take, uh, if you go to Guatemala, for example, Catholic Relief Services is working with local communities to the local leading uh, approach uh, to go on, uh, participatory approach to program planning, to engage uh, the input and then the contribution of different stakeholders to define solution, water solutions for their communities. And in Sierra Leone, for example, where we have, uh, especially in Freetown, where the peninsula watershed, it's a problem. We've, we're working with partners there uh, to the water fund to look at how uh, we can uh, uh, address uh, the water source problem in the peninsula for the current urban population and also the future population that is yet to come. Um, with regards to transboundary related water issues, uh, if you take Lake Chad, for example, or the Chad Basin, we are working there with communities in both Nigeria and Chad uh, to make sure that uh, water services, both for agriculture use and also for domestic consumption, is done in a way that communities coexist uh, so that there is no conflict between communities when uh, they try to assess or use water resources, uh, given the water crisis in that particular region. And on the financing side of how do we finance these interventions, which is one of the critical areas that uh, the UN and sector partners have identified as key to uh, achieving the SDGs, We've also uh, worked with uh, different stakeholders, all in the principle of collaboration to the blended financing mechanism in El Salvador, uh, where we are supporting water service providers uh, to be able to assess funds and then provide water for consumption again, also for agricultural services and other livelihoods that they feel very important. But these are just a few, a couple of few examples that I have to share with you. Uh, but the issue around uh, cooperation and, uh, and, and, and participation, uh, I see it in a way that requires critical attention because they are water sources around the world. If you take the Nubian, the Nubian sandstone, for example, that cuts across different sovereign countries, Sudan, uh, South Sudan and, and, and Ethiopia and others. These water resources need uh, a way of uh, different actors sitting together and, and knowing how they will be able to exploit the resource given that that particular region is now uh, facing water crisis due to climate change. So it, it, all in all, the hope is not lost. That just to say that there's a lot that is happening and what CRS is doing uh, in terms of uh, reaching out to different actors is we are active uh, at different levels, engaging with different uh, partners. At the country level, we are part of different collaborative mechanisms, the Agenda for Change, for example, um, that uh, we are a key member. And also the local characters uh, that we work with to which, uh, which for us is one of our comparative ad advantage because uh, it gives us uh, an additional oversight in terms of accountability of our work uh, within that space. And at the regional level too, we are also engaged, actively engaged in discussions around how we integrate or deal with water resources management. For instance, we just signed an MOU with the AMCAO, the African Water. Uh, Minister's Council on Water to be part of the advocacy around how we get different stakeholders to engage and also implement concrete actions, or more or less follow up on political commitments that uh, sovereign states will make towards addressing water related issues. So yeah, so I'd say uh, in terms of uh, the challenges, uh, all is not lost, there is hope. But what we need to do as sector partners, especially uh, from uh, our Catholic community, even the Pope 
and yesterday's uh, Holy Father's mail, uh, yeah, message on World Water Day it was very clear about how uh, we all need to take uh, action to avoid polluting or wasting resource water resources around the world. So that is one thing that we need to look at. And more importantly, uh, no, recognizing that water, it's a, it's a transboundary or doesn't respect sovereign states, it is critical that the geographic divisions that we have in country should um, be reconsidered. In other words, we take a watershed or water catchment management approach to water resource use because water in a particular catchment, be it used for consumption, agricultural purposes, industrial purposes, or for energy, affects everybody within that community. A case in point is what uh, uh, was done uh, in the, uh, uh, between uh, the Nile Basin uh, uh, countries uh, to, to ensure that uh, the Renaissance Dam built by Ethiopia is functioning. So these are issues that require different levels of engagement, different levels of partnership, that Catholic Relief Services, wherever possible, will play a role or have been playing a role to ensuring that everybody everywhere has the right uh, that uh, the UN uh, 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 agreed to in 2005 uh, and nobody is left out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, and you rightly um, drew attention to the latest World Water Development Report, focusing on partnerships and cooperation. In the chat, I have put a link to the report uh, in case anyone would like to read it. The United Nations, all agencies, we have a policy of uh, open access. So uh, all of our publications are free for download in various languages. I've also put a link uh, because uh, there was an international uh, a transboundary water coalition, a water cooperation coalition that was launched uh, at UNESCO in December. And U UNESCO is one of the partners, uh, but it's a very broad coalition. And you can find more information about this here, but you might be interested to know that most of the, uh, the uh, cooperation agreements and other uh, international arrangements for transboundary uh, water resources concern rivers uh, rather than um, aquifers, uh, which flow underground and are often out of sight and out of mind. So uh, from at this point, uh, I don't think uh, we have many questions. We have one question from Anais. So maybe Anais, uh, if you could set the ball rolling and indicate uh, to whom you're addressing your, your question or whether it would it is addressed to all four panelists. Thank Go you. Ahead, Anais. Um, thank you. Anyone can answer this. I was just wondering if any of you would be able to speak on the role that youth can play in this effort, because I myself am part of the youth, so I was wondering what I could do to help. So uh, who among the panelists would like to answer that question? I'll go. I'll, I'll, I'll take a first shot. Okay, David. Yeah, you, it's, uh, you, uh, it, that is a critical mass in terms of getting voices heard around the table. So if you look at uh, Catholic Relief Services strategy and I guess other strategies towards uh, um, water resource management, water resource use, the idea of getting stakeholders around the table is not to have a uniform class category of stakeholders, but a diverse uh, uh, workforce or voice that will represent what uh, what is happening. And, and with regards to uh, the youth, you have a critical role to play around advocacy uh, and in, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, the role that the special rapporteur mentioned, like he used the word defenders of the right. And that's a clear uh, uh, role that you play. In addition, uh, when it comes to uh, the practical level, monitoring and also ensure monitoring water resources use and exploitation for, I know uh, you are playing a critical role in our programming. 
and places like El Salvador and other countries around the world. Um, and also in some places also being key members of a water uh, management committees. Uh, so there is a, a critical role uh, for youth to play in the whole uh, water uh, space. Thank you, David. Would any of the other panelists like to answer this question? Okay, well, in that case, uh, we have one another question from Bernadette, who uh, asks whether uh, any of the panelists know if there is somebody working with people on water problems in South Africa. Can any of the panelists answer that question? So while I'm not a panelist, I do know <laughs> that we have Caritas working in South Africa. So Bernadette, I can send you my email and we can follow up separately um, as regards our Caritas network in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brianna. Perfect answer. Uh, could I now perhaps pass the floor back to you so that you can say a few concluding remarks? I'd, just before I do so, I'd just like to thank very warmly uh, our four panelists who took very different uh, approaches, uh, discussed different issues, uh, but they have very well illustrated the United Nations rapporteur's uh, points. Uh, he, he said that we needed to make peace with our rivers, with our wetlands, by restoring them, looking after them, and we needed to promote democratic governance. And I think all of the speakers have provided very good evidence of, of uh, that this is happening at the local level. Over to you, Brianna. Thank you so much, Susan. It's been great to have you facilitate this session with your insight, especially also with UNESCO's partnership on transboundary water cooperation and scientific water cooperation. It's been really interesting to see what UNESCO and other UN agencies have done um, in the past year leading up to this conference, and I'm excited to see all of this put into action. Um, speaking of action, we have a policy position paper that I have just sent to everyone in the chat. It is translated in English, French, and Spanish. And while we do find that it's important to encourage stakeholders and policymakers to act, it's also important for us to act. And so we have made a commitment to the water action agenda, which will be the outcome document or the grand outcome of this water conference happening at the UM. And so you all will be among the first to hear that our commitment is that Caritas Internationalis commits itself to the water action agenda of the UN 2023 Water Conference by pledging to the continued collection of expertise on water, specifically on the WASH sector, water food security nexus, and water climate nexus from local and indigenous members of the communities of care that came to be, be via Caritas Internationalis Together We campaign on integral ecology, and further to sharing examples of lived experiences and best practices with all relevant stakeholders that are keen to learn, share, and implement solution-oriented sustainable practices on water, including individuals, partners, and institutions at all levels from the local community level to the global stage. So I want to thank our global campaign director, Alfonso, who's been a part of this core water team for leading the Together We campaign that really inspired this commitment to localization, but also to bringing localized experience to the global stage. That commitment basically means we'll continue to have events like this. We'll continue to have policy position papers that are taken up by the Confederation as a whole so we can share expertise and partner with agencies like UNESCO and the UN, the Laudato Sea Platform and others who we are meeting for the first time here today and those we have partnered with for many years in the past. I want to once again thank everybody for staying with us just a few extra minutes. I know we had some technological issues at the beginning. Those seem to have resolved themselves, thank God. Um, we definitely had a guardian angel watching over us as we fixed that interpretation. If anybody wants to get in touch with me to be put in touch with the panelists or Ms. Schneegans or with our campaign coordinator, Alfonso, I'm going to leave my email in the chat once again, excellencies, distinguished colleagues, thank you so much for being here. Enjoy the rest of the water conference, your days and evenings ahead. 
and let's go together because together we go furthest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye, everybody. It was a great Thank session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed much. it. Yes. I've also put my email in the chat in case bye -bye. you like more information. Bye. All the best. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, panelists. Muchas gracias, Viana. Gracias, John. Muchas gracias. Adios. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks.